blessings of this life. We're thankful for this congregation of thy people. We pray, Father, that you be with those who are suffering any kind of difficulty. We ask, Father, that you bless us all and help us as we study thy word. So we're very thankful for the word and we're thankful, Father, for the way you have allowed it to be with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to be thinking about uh, some lessons from the book of Hebrews today. I've studied a little bit of Hebrews with you before, but I've come up with some other things that have attracted my mind in the book, and I want to spend a little time on the book of Hebrews. I think this is a good book for congregations that are established uh, like ours here at East Hill or like Hob Street down uh, in Athens, established congregations that have before them the challenge of maintaining faithfulness in a difficult time, in challenging times. I think Hebrews helps us with that. And there are a lot of reasons that that would be the case because in the case of the book of Hebrews, it's written to to Christians, obviously, with a Jewish background, with a Hebrew background. And they were facing some, some kind of difficulty. It's not explicitly explained as to what kind of uh, trial and difficulty they were facing, but the, the, uh, the solution was one that was uh, spiritually unacceptable. Uh, in the Roman Empire, the, the Romans provided the Jews with the dispensation from having to worship the Roman deities. Uh, in order to get a business license back then, uh, as I understand it through reading about it, was you had to be able to say Caesar is God. Uh, Kaiser et Deus is es Deus. But, uh, of course, a Christian couldn't do that. A Jew couldn't do that. And the Romans had learned enough about the Jews that they couldn't make them do it. What the, what the Romans did with the Jews, when the Jews got troublesome for them in a particular area, they'd either persecute them or send them away, like Aquila and Priscilla was sent away from Rome, that situation. So the Hebrew letter, as you read it, and you've read it, I know anybody in this class would have read it a number of times. The Hebrew letter is about don't go back to the law of Moses. Don't go back to the law of Moses. Don't go back to the law of Moses. Stay with Christ because Christ is the better way. He's the better messenger, the better angel. He's the better uh, son. He's, He's the better high priest he he provides a better rest all of those things the theme of better is all the way through the book of hebrews and so the the challenge that they were facing as christians was uh, to maintain faith in christ and not take the easy way out because they could they could say well i'm a jew and therefore i don't have to give in to this law that the romans had about saying Caesar is, is God. So in order to function in the empire, all they have to do is give up Christ and go back to Judaism or go back to the law of Moses. And so the letter is, is written to encourage them not to do that. And uh, we, see, we see that in uh, chapter 2, first couple of verses of chapter 2 of the book of Hebrews, Where the writer says, and we'll say something about the writer in a moment, he says, therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we we let them slip, or lest we slip away, we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, the old translation said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken, by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them who heard him, God also bearing them witness, both the signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So that's the, that's the thesis statement of the book of Hebrews. We can't go back. We can't, uh, we can't drift away from, from Christ. We have to stay with him. I uh, can't go back to the law of Moses. Now, we're not tempted to go back to the law of Moses. We're not about to do that. I mean, we, we, wouldn't, we don't keep that law. We keep the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. 
We do keep law. We just don't keep the law of Moses. And, uh, of course, the law of Moses didn't come into effect until a long time after Abraham uh, became Abraham. He went from Abram to Abraham. So you've got the patriarchal dispensation. We know we're not in that. And we're not under the law of Moses. What's left for us is the law of Christ. Now, we're not going to go back to the law of Moses. But we could go back to where we came from. If we came out of the world, if we came out of some, some man-made religion, if we just came out of being worldly or just being a normal everyday citizen in the world, we could go back to that. A lot of people do. A lot of people have. They've lost their faith in Jesus. They've lost their confidence that his church is the way to go. And, you know, we were, I was talking to James, we, we go down like uh, where I was, those congregations, there are many congregations over there in that, in Marion County, Walker County, all those counties in that area. And uh, some of them are just getting smaller and smaller because people, you know, they, they, a, lot of, a lot of times it's because the kids move away. They, they go off to have a better job somewhere. I mean, a lot of it is that. And, but some people just leave the church. And I always say that if we had everybody who was a member of a congregation of the Lord's Church in Limestone County, if everybody showed up to go to church on a particular Sunday, the auditoriums would not hold them. You, you, they, we'd fill up every single auditorium. We'd have to put out chairs and have people in the lobby. There's that many people in the church that aren't in the church anymore. And so when we look at the book of Hebrews with what it says about the essentiality of maintaining faithfulness to Jesus Christ, it fits our world perfectly because we need these lessons. That we, need, we need to understand uh, that these are challenges. Now, why is it that we have this situation these days? I think it's, uh, it seems to me, and I'm just one fellow, but it seems to me that there's a, uh, it's, it's easy Based on the warnings we see revealed in the text, it's easy to, to slip away, to use the language in, in Hebrews 2. Um, it's, it's like the river. Uh, we cross the Elk River coming up here. I've, I've crossed the Tennessee a couple of times, crossed some of the others, uh, the Sipsi. I've crossed a number of rivers, and some of them were, were up. And if you, uh, if you just put a canoe or a kayak or a small rowboat or flat bottom in those rivers when they're moving like that, uh, unless you've got a good motor or a strong arm to, to row with, you're going to go where that river takes you. We've all been in that situation. You're going to go where that river takes you. And, uh, you, you know, if you don't want to go that way, you have to make arrangements to be able to get out of that stream. Well, this world we're in is a river that's going in a particular direction. Our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5 eight. We resist him, he'll flee from us, but we've got to resist him. And uh, if we just let the world take us where it will, a lot of, I think a lot of young people get caught up in that. And a lot of older people get caught up in that. Uh, they get caught up in just saying, well, you know, the world wants me to do this and uh, you know, everybody out there in the world, they're, they're disregarding God's will about marriage and they're disregarding God's will about immorality. They're disregarding all these things. And uh, you can get caught up in that, in that stream. And I think that's what happens to a lot of our people. And, you know, I, I'll go talk to, I don't mean to digress too much from this, but I'll go talk to folks like that. And I spent a lot of time doing that when I was in local work. And they'll say, well, so-and-so, I was going to church all the time, but then so-and-so was, was mean to me. Somebody said something critical to me, and it upset me, so I just couldn't go back to church up there anymore. Or I'll hear, well, the church is just unfriendly, unfriendly. I've, I've only preached three places full time. I've never been in an unfriendly congregation. I've visited tons of congregations. And I've only been to one that I would characterize as unfriendly, and that's because, you know, they didn't know me, I didn't know them. But the fact is that it doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter. You can't let some nosy person, some vocal busybody, run you off from Lord Jesus Christ, can you? Say somebody said something to you that was mean. You're going to let one mean person move you away from the Lord Jesus who gave his life for us on the ground? No, we're not going to do that. Can't do that. And uh, I, I'll tell you how to deal with unfriendliness. Somebody give me the answer. How can you erase unfriendliness? Be friendly. Brownie said, and Miss Brown, that's exactly the way you do it. Right, treat them right. Treat them like Jesus would treat them. So that's why the thing makes application. That's why the book of Hebrews has an application for us. And the way we keep ourselves in the right mindset with regard to these issues is to stay very close to the Word of God. And that's one of the things that, that uh, the writer of Hebrews deals with. Now, the writer of Hebrews is a question, of course. And, uh, of course, it doesn't, it's not attributed. There's no attribution in the book of Hebrews as to who, who wrote it. Um, so uh, then we're left to uh, understand ourselves, try to figure it out ourselves. And we, we have to be humble enough to say we can't say for sure. Because the only way you can say for sure is if there's something in the text itself. Something in the text itself that says you know, from Paul at, or by Timothy from Paul, that sort of thing. But the, you look at the ideas that are expressed in the book of Hebrews, and the ideas that are expressed in the book of Hebrews are very much the ideas that we find in Galatians and Romans, uh, Paul's ideas. And as we've mentioned before, when we study the book of Hebrews, when we, uh, you don't have to be a very big uh, or successful Greek scholar to figure out that the Greek of Hebrews, the New Testament Greek of Hebrews, it's the same language. It's Koine Greek or common Greek. But it is, uh, the way it's structured is different. Is different from uh, the rest of Paul's letters. But the ideas are so, so much from Paul that it seems fair to say that the uh, ideas are Paul's, but somebody else wrote it down. Somebody else wrote it down, somebody else dictated it. Uh, so, and so my solution to the problem, it's not, it's not something that has to be agreed uh, to by everybody. My solution to who wrote Hebrews is that uh, it sounds like, have you ever read this book out loud to yourself? This is one of the things about Bible study that's fascinating to me. And we're in class, I'm just gonna throw this out here as an idea. Sometimes you just have to read the text out loud and listen to it. Even though you're reading it, you can, it's, it's different when you read it out loud. And see, this, this is a text that's, that is, was written all the Bible, but particularly the New Testament, was written to be uh, an exposition. It was written to be spoken at some point to other people. And a lot of that's a lot of times that's why when you're in a personal Bible study with somebody, some of the best things to do you get to a passage and, and you know that they're not going to agree with it to start with. The best thing to do is to have them read it, have them read it themselves. And when you do that, you find uh, it has a, a, I think it has a, a bigger impact. So I don't know, years ago I decided I would just read the book of Hebrews because I ran across an idea. And I don't know where I got the idea, but uh, I've kind of made it my own idea. That Hebrews is a sermon, or a bunch of sermons. Uh, what we might, this would be a sermon uh, that uh, like Gus Nichols might preach. Or, you know, take a two, like a fellow said, I, I attended a two weeks meeting one night. Brother Nichols preached. James, you know about that. You know, and some of these old preachers uh, would preach. Uh, you'd rebel against it. You really would. <laughs> I mean, they preach two hours on Sunday morning. And you're thinking about that roast is going to be dry as, a, as potato chips. But if you read the book, you find a lot of places in it where it sounds 
sermonic. It sounds sermonic. It has a lot of uh, exhortations. Well, let us do this. Let us do that. It has a lot of therefores. Therefore this, therefore that. And, you, and uh, so you look at this as, as a sermonic. And let's look at a particular passage that speaks to the, to the problem of maintaining faithfulness. And that's in chapter 5 and verses 12 through 14. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, 12 through 14. And, and, and think about this as if it's not a letter but it's somebody's transcription, like Timothy or, or Luke or, or Aquila, or somebody's transcription. Yes, sir? No, sir. I think most of them were written first and then read to the congregations. Yes, sir. That's what I think, but, you know, based on, based on the way they're constructed. So let's look at this verse uh, 12 through 14 of Hebrews chapter 5, where it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So staying with the word exercises our senses to discern right from wrong, good from evil. And so then in chapter 6, the first few verses, he deals with the idea that you've got to go on, go forward. He said, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of the fundamentals of Christ, let us go on to perfection or to completion, maturation, maturity. Let us go on to maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now those doctrines are all important. They're very significant. And every child of God, every Christian ought to have a settled view of all of those doctrinal things that he mentions there in verses 1 and 2. But you've got to go on. You've got to add to. You've got to stay with it. You've got to go deeper. Even in those areas, you can't stay on the surface. If you stay on the surface, it's easy to get knocked off. It's easy to get pushed aside, just like anything else. So he says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heaven, the gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucified for themselves the Son of God and crucified again for themselves or afresh, the old translation says, and put him to an open shame. Now, People say, well, that means that once you fall away, you're lost. You can't come back. Well, if you stay gone, you are. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? If you stay gone, if you give in, like if you leave, if you leave Jesus. Well, there's a way, that's a one way to look at it brother that here it's it's not so much uh well it's i think it's up to us anyway the uh the holy spirit works say again well you can turn away from that people do all the time if you, if you, the, the connection with God, when a person becomes a child of God, is baptized into Christ, that ought to be a permanent connection. If the person has a right kind of heart. No, no. It's not something the Spirit does to you. It's something you do in response to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is teaching us every single day through the Word of God what's right to do. 
And in that sense, he's part of us. Because you keep in your mind what the Spirit has instructed us. It's not, it's not that he's sitting around in you making um, involuntary reactions of yourself to the world. What we do is listen to him. If we reject him, say if I, if, say if I memorize, uh, for instance, solid food belongs to those who are full age. If I memorize that and it's part of my heart and mind, and then I reject that, I have rejected the Holy Spirit. Now I can go down the road and decide I was wrong to reject what the Holy Spirit said in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit never says anything contrary to the Word of God. And He always tells us through the Word what He wants us to do. And so the idea in, in Hebrews 6 is that if, if I persist in rejecting the direction that comes from God. For instance, if I'm reading the Sermon on the Mount and I get to, he, I get to uh, Matthew chapter 5, and verse 43, and it says that I have to love everybody. And that was put there through the Holy Spirit. And if I then decide, well, I, I'm, I can't love everybody because everybody's not worthy of my love, then I've rejected what the Spirit has said. It's certainly near the top of the list. It's certainly near the top of the list. That's right. Well, you know, it's funny you should mention that. I, I talked about uh, this over at West Fayetteville a couple of weeks ago. The peril of unforgiveness from the unrighteous steward. Remember the guy? Remember the guy? He, uh, he was in debt to his boss, to his overlord. The guy says, you got to pay or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock you up and your family. And he told him, so I can't pay you. I can't pay you. And so he, he ended up uh, forgiving him his debt. And then another fellow comes along that owed that guy just a little bit in comparison to what he owed. And he locked him up. Wouldn't forgive him. What happens? Torture. The Bible says the person who is unforgiving... I know it's a parable of Jesus's, and it's not talking about something literal, but it's talking about something spiritual. The parable says that the person who won't forgive is facing torture. Let's return to this text a little bit. I've got one or a couple other things before we, we run out of time here. So he tells them, some of you all are babes, and you're, you're treading on dangerous ground because... Uh, you can fix it so, and this is your point, I think, you can make it so that you can't ever come back. But that's something we do. If we act in such a fashion that we turn our backs fully on God and stay that way, we can't come back. But God's always willing to forgive. When Peter asked him, well, how many times do I forgive somebody? Seven He says he forgives when you ask for forgiveness. That's 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. I think if you go to God sincerely and ask for forgiveness, he gives it to you, if you're a child of God. But if you go to him insincerely, and I've, uh, you know, been in this business a long time, seen a lot of people that will show people I'm not talking about Nashville folks. I'm talking about folks who live their Christianity as a show. And it wasn't something sincere. It wasn't something that went deep. If you pretend to forgive, for, to ask for forgiveness, you won't get forgiveness. A lot of fakes out there, brother. A lot of fakes. Don't know where you find them. Do what you want to do. That's right. 
And I think that's the lesson of the book of Hebrews, because what he's said here, he's stated their problem. And it's a problem we have. We stay on the surface. We have what we think we can repeat and know. We don't go deep enough. And so what, what the writer says, I believe it to be Paul, but it, it may not be. In verse 9, he says about them who face this danger. Now, he wouldn't be telling them that there's a way out if there wasn't a way out. And there is a way out. He said, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown in his name, toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The promises of God are sure. He never backs up on any of his promises. But our obedience to God and the acceptance of those promises is, is something that's left to us. Human beings are created as free will moral agents. And we have the opportunity to be faithful to God and to modify our wills to match the will of God. He expects that of us. And he provides uh, help in that regard through the teaching of the word of God. So he's asking, the the writer here is reminding them of the challenges that, that they face. If they go back to the law of Moses, they don't have the access to Jesus that they have if they remain in Christ. And they can lose that access. If they lose that access, and stay away from it. It's very simple. When somebody leaves the church and they say, well, they can't come back, or you know, they, they, they lost their desire to come back. Anybody can come back, but you have to want to. It has to be sincere. And it has to go deep inside the human being himself. So there are things that accompany salvation. And, uh, you know, it's like, the patterns in 2 Timothy 1.13, there's a pattern revealed. We need to worship according to that pattern and, and uh, work according to that pattern. And most of all, I believe we need to love according to that pattern. And I, I want to tell you something about loving according to the pattern that God has revealed. First of all, we need to love with humility. Now, Jesus uh, gives us the example of humility. And he gave himself. And anytime we think, well, what I'm doing, yes, I'm doing it because of Jesus and all of that, but I still want to get a little credit for it. I want people to know what I am and who I am and so forth. This is important because you can fall away to the extent that you don't come back. And we don't want that to happen to anybody. But it's, you know, and I I don't know about you, if you've done very much personal work, you'll find that you run into some hard cases. I've sat across the table from people that tell me, well, I can't go back to the church. Church is full of uh, bad people. Well, the church is not full of bad people. Say we're wrong about everything. I don't believe we're wrong about everything. Yeah, that's not their point, though. Their point is not that. Their point is I can't come back to the church because the people in the church are mean and bad. Right. It's not my fault. They did it. That's correct. That's correct. The point is, however, that people like us, we need to be sure that we stay so close to Jesus through the word, doing what he says. People say, well, I'm, I feel close to Jesus. Listen, let me tell you something about feeling. doesn't make a dime's worth of difference in your spiritual life. Your emotions must serve what you know. Knowledge drives emotion. Emotion is the slave of knowledge, not the other way around. Say that again. So why is all this important? It's important because we live in a world where uh, like this world is that is that stream. And it's catching people. It's catching people. 
and it's moving them away from Jesus Christ. So what the writer here says, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Now, what have they heard? They heard that without Jesus, they had no hope. Say by grace through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. They heard that they were to be baptized into Christ to be raised to walk in newness of life. That's what they heard. Now, you can't move away from that. I mean, they couldn't, and we can't. Now, I don't know how many, if, if you've had the discussion with somebody concerning the plan of salvation, just something as simple as the plan of salvation. There are a lot of people in the world who say that has nothing to do with being saved. They say, you know, according to Acts 22, 16, and uh, uh, Romans 10, 19, and Matthew chapter 10, and Joel chapter 2, all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord. It'd be good if you wave your hands a little bit, but call on the name of the Lord. It has nothing to do with it. You might feel like, somebody might feel like that's salvation, but that's not salvation. Salvation is when, when in, in, in the human being that we decide, I'm going to submit to Jesus Christ in everything that he has said and how I learn to love, how I learn to treat people, and what I need to do to be saved. I can't keep any of that for Bill to have control over. And so I think that's one reason that we have here uh, this concept of you need to stay with what you've heard. Now, a lot of people will tell you, well, now what I've heard was old news. You know, I've heard that all my life. I had a young lady tell me one time, I said, I missed you Sunday. And she went off and she said, well, I had to go somewhere else. And she told me where she went, and I'm not going to mention it to you, but she said, I had to go get my batteries recharged. I said, what you talking about? What you talking about? She said, well, you know, the, the service was so uplifting. You know, it was one of these modern, jazzy-type outfits, you know. I said, got my battery recharged. It's no, nothing to it. Nothing to it. It's like you hook it, hook both. Uh, you got your battery charger, your start box right there, and you hook both, both things to neutral. What's it going to do? It's gonna have, you're going to have to complete the circuit. And what's the center of the circuit? If you're going to have a battery, spiritual battery recharging requires the completion of a circuit. But that circuit has to include the Word of God. So it's an it's important element. With these people, uh, they, they should not go back to the old covenant. They couldn't. Now, what I'm going to talk about in the lesson this morning is is an element of what they would give up if they left Jesus. And I, won't, I don't want to preach until 2 o'clock this afternoon, so I'm going to give you a little heads up on that. Look over to chapter 3. In chapter 3 of Hebrews, he's talking about the time when the nation of Israel was unfaithful to God. And because they were unfaithful to God, they could not enter into the rest that God had provided for them. So verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years, therefore I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And you remember a goodly number of them didn't. Yeah, That's right. Only two made it of that age group. That's right. And, you know, they saw the, so they, what they saw. I don't know how they turned their backs on it, but they did. They worshipped the gold. They worshipped the golden calf. So, so that was a historical reference in Hebrews 3. And then there's the application of that reference. It's a reference to the Old Testament. And this is why I think this is sermonic material. Because out of the quotation of the Old Testament, he comes and says, Beware, brethren, 
lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So he, he goes from what they did to what he doesn't want us to do, and that's to depart from the living God. He said, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What happens? If we stay, if we continue to try to follow our own direction, it will harden us to the point where we won't respond properly. Now, you can, you can see this happen in human relations. A father and a son fall out. And then they both go off to their respective corners. And they harden their point of view. They say, well, you know, he, uh, he did this or he did that. And, and, you know, they get to a point where they won't even listen to each other. You've seen that? You can shake or nod, but, you, but you've seen that. Estranged. They call it, I'm estranged from my father, estranged from my mother, estranged from my wife, all of that. And they can stay that way their whole lives and die that way. I'll tell you one of the most heart-rendering things is uh, to preach a funeral for somebody who's done that. Colin, I know you preached a few. I've preached a few where people have done that. James, you too. You know, any, you, you see these people that used to be a family. It's like us. We used, you know, we're a family with God. He's our father. Jesus is our elder brother. But you can become so estranged that you won't go back. That's the danger that we need to avoid. It, Excuse me? Look at Saul. He was the enemy of Christ. David was good and bad. He was. He was, but he learned better. And the difference is, it's a good example, but the difference is, what did, what did Saul do when he learned better? He changed. He changed. Yeah. Exactly. You got to turn. That's right. We got we got to give in. It's it's just like uh, uh, like in a, in an example in humanity. And if there's two people that are estranged from each other, somebody says, "Well." I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll talk to you if you say you're sorry first. And the other one says, well, I, I might talk to them, but they've got to apologize to me first. All right. What's the biblical point of view? You've got, well, the thing is, the strong person goes first. You know, you say, well, I've been wronged. I've been wrong. Well, that's fine. You didn't have anything to do with it. I've never seen two people that were in a fuss that, that were both totally innocent. Have you? There's always somebody, even if you're mainly innocent. Is there something you could have done? And when it comes to God, it's not a two-way street. We don't, we don't sit around waiting for him to say, you know, I did this wrong because he didn't do anything wrong. What, he, what he's done was right altogether. Our job is to submit totally to him without doubt and without question is to submit to God. And if we've, been, if we've done something wrong, we need, and we need to get rid of the ego, get rid of the me, myself, and I, and submit to the Lord. All right. If we don't have that, we're done. We're done. Well, listen, it's about time for us to, to be dismissed, and uh, we'll let you go a minute, and then we'll come back together for our worship service, and we're going to talk about this rest in Hebrews. I want you to talk. I want you to think between now and the time for the sermon, but don't think about it when you're taking the Lord's Supper. I want you to think about 
how tired you've ever been and how much you've ever looked forward to resting. Thank you. You be dismissed until time for our worship service.